Meredith, great yeah. to see you again. Great to see you too. <laughs> and great to ride with you. Yes, exactly. Right? It's always fun. We've we've done this many, many times we've over the years. We've done this many times. <laughs> but why don't we uh, uh, do this? Uh, why don't you take a moment just to quickly introduce yourself for those that don't know you yet. I am Meredith Glazer. I'm the CEO of Urban Cycling Institute, a nonprofit based in Amsterdam, and also professor of cycling at Ghent University. Wow, and that's new. And that is new, yes. It's a, it's a new chair. So it's the chair of cycling at Ghent University, Department of Geography. And um, it's funded through the Ministry of Public Works. Um, so it's sort of an experimental collaboration between a high level political body and, uh, and a university. Mm -hmm. um, especially for, for the Belgian case. Um, there are not very many cases of, uh, of this type of collaboration. So I think it's quite innovative. Uh, and the whole goal of it is to, um, is to stimulate cycling, but also to provide a, um, a critical knowledge broker for the Ministry of, uh, of Public Works um, to help them analyze their, the policies that they are creating um, and to, uh, to improve cycling for, uh, for the Flemish uh, and Belgian population. Fantastic. And we, of course, were just in Ghent. Yeah, we were just in Ghent. Uh, for the Velo City Conference. Yeah. How cool was that to oh, be able to have like a, a party in the yeah. city where just a few months prior you you know were awarded this yeah. this this little position or yeah. this big position <laughs> it's a very it's a very honorable yeah. position um i since it's so new um a lot of people are very excited about it mm -hmm. um and there are also critics yeah which i am very welcome to uh, most of the critics were uh, were saying things like, "What is an American who lives in Amsterdam doing in Belgium, mm -hmm. teaching the Belgians about cycling?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and and I like that I like that critique because uh, because actually it's a point of strength. Right. Um, that I I acknowledge my outsider role here. Mm -hmm. uh, I am an outsider in my in my in terms of my nationality, in terms of the my the culture I was raised in as an American, um, and uh, but also that brings a lot of value to uh, to understand cy uh, cycling and and governance and institutions um, because I have a very a natural curiosity about how things work mm -hmm. and um, and so I think to to bring in an outsider perspective um, that's a strength that can add um, you know a critical perspective and um, and yeah and also be able to to ask questions that maybe a Belgian wouldn't be able to ask right yeah and in this role what What's really the, the, the goal in terms of interacting with students and things of yeah. that nature? Yeah, um, there are several um, different focuses for the, for the chair. Mm -hmm. um, one is research. Yeah. Um, another focus is interaction with uh, different levels of government. Right. So on the local level, uh, I have a focus on understanding the process of transformation within the city of Ghent, right. um, which has been kind of disseminated around Europe, at least, um, that uh, the city has undergone a lot of changes um, and become a lot more bicycle friendly in the last uh, decade or so. And so I want to further understand that but also at the national or the regional and national level, so the Flemish level and then the, the Belgian level. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also a focus on social impact. So that is more the interaction with, um, with students and, uh, and professionals. Right. So um, how can we, um, as a discipline, help students to learn more about transitions so we're going to go this way. 
how can, yeah, how can the, the discipline of urban planning um, strengthen its position on learning? Mm -hmm. um, we need multidisciplinary interaction um, and, uh, and we need new types of curricula. Um, we need new types of uh, ways of learning about this topic. Um, and for the most part, a lot of our, um, a lot of the way that we teach our students is, is well, still based, especially in traffic engineering and traffic design, um, is still based on, on quite old 20th century principles of highway planning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're in Amsterdam this yeah. morning. Yeah. And today you were with some students from California. Yes. And one of the things that you had brought up, which you know reminds me of some of our earlier conversations that we had yeah. when we were when you were studying the impact of uh, learning from other locations yeah. and everything. Yeah. And so one of the things that was interesting about how you structured their experiment today and their exercise today yeah. was rather than just leading a study tour, leading yeah. a tour on bikes, yeah. you sent them off to explore yes. and learn on their own. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that because that's a, a big part of your DNA in your studies is yeah. what are the most effective ways of learning when you're in an urban context? Yeah, and most effective but also undervalued. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I found from uh, research on education and professional development is that as adults, we come into learning experiences with all types of, uh, of baggage. Um, we come in with experiences, uh, memories, um, you know, formulative understandings and worldviews, and and this informs how we learn. So we need to acknowledge that, um, that both students and professionals, of course, learn in different ways and each individual has, uh, has its own characteristics in, when it comes to learning. And we need to give professionals and students more autonomy and agency when they are, when they are learning. So if we're riding around in a big group, going from site to site, that's a very passive form of learning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and giving a lecture is also a very passive form of learning. So what the activity that, I, that I'm doing today with them is trying to activate their own sense of self-efficacy, their own sense of confidence, um, to try to nurture um, this, yeah, this innate sense of curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and yeah. I think that's, that's, um, that's something that we have as humans and, um, and it just kind of needs to be nudged. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, and the, the subject that we're discussing, mobility, public space, the way that our, our built environments are designed and experienced, this is something that is so experiential right and um and being a newcomer in a city one of the best ways to experience it is by foot or by bike right um and i think especially by bike because of the here we can just come off the side here actually i think especially by bike because of the uh the way that you can the, or I, I guess the distances that you can cover right. by bike, yeah. Yeah. right? Yes. Um, so by foot, you can only go so far before your feet are tired, yeah. right? But yeah. by bike, you can actually cross a lot of the city yeah. in the six hours that they have. Right, so right. this activity yeah. uh, tries to engage them in their social spatial sur uh, surroundings and environment. It asks them to um, talk to strangers, to interview people on the street, um, to try to actually put on a social science hat right. and, um, and to, to do ethnography, to do more kind of deeper observation, 
an experiential learning. Right, right. You know, one of the things that you talked about with the students, too, is that, yes, we are in a city. We're in a big city. Yep. And, you know, Amsterdam uh, certainly is, is viewed internationally as like this cycling paradi paradise, etc. But you pointed out, no, it's not perfect. There's plenty of challenges that Amsterdam is still working on. And um, I suspect that that's a little bit of the work that you do here locally mm -hmm. uh, with the University of Amsterdam mm -hmm. and then also with the Urban Cycling Institute. Mm -hmm. Why don't you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about those two roles and mm -hmm. you know this, this wonderful learning environment that you have, which is right here at home yeah. in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, as a, as a, a lecturer um, at the University of Amsterdam, we, and, and um, with Urban Cycling Institute, a lot of our learning products, our trainings, our seminars, courses, they all involve an experiential, uh, yeah, an experiential side to them, uh, our aspect. Um, but not only the experiential side, I think more importantly is to, yes, to experience, but then also to take that experience and uh, reflect on it. Uh, and then, and then try to apply the lessons from that to um, academic insights. Right. And then to their home context, right. for instance. Right. So it becomes a a learning cycle, yeah. and uh, and that constant process of experience, reflect, apply. Experience, yeah. reflect, apply, um, which creates this kind of spiral effect. Mm -hmm. And um, and we see uh, really um, strong outcomes of, of learning when uh, when students engage in this in this cyclical process. Yeah. Um, so that means that you know before before our, our participants come to class, we give them a sort of to do list, mm -hmm. and they have to go out in the city and they have to visit a site or do something. They have to observe. They have to take notes. And then when we come to class, we have a discussion about it and then they create questions for the lecturer. Right. And, um, and then the lecturer will, will kind of have more of a Q&A session rather mm -hmm. than a, a traditional lecture. Yeah. Um, and then the, the process keeps going. Right. Right. right? So in, this is inquiry-based learning. This is, right. uh, this is uh, you know, student or participant-led learning. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a very effective it's a very effective tool. Yeah, yeah. When you, in, in your role with the Urban Cycling Institute, you're obviously interacting with people from all around the world. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges that we now face in 2024 when we're trying to like, come on, move the, keep moving the ball forward, keep moving the needle? Um, you know, obviously every place is coming at it from a different you know, position and a different set of momentum, but what are you kind of seeing right now as the zeitgeist in 2024? Um, and halfway done with 2024. Oh yeah, that's right? true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're yeah. heading into 2025. By the way, ha happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. <laughs> Freedom, right? Yes. Freedom. Freedom of bicycles, yes. Freedom. <laughs> um, Freedom to move. You know, coming yeah. into 2025, we still see huge challenges in our cities. Yeah. Um, still in 2025, we have accepted as society that 1.3 million people every year are dying uh, because of the traffic systems that we have created. Right. Um, we are still accepting extremely long commute times. Right. Uh, we are still accepting that that there is, um, you know, very severe inequities in our society dealing with uh, with health and um, uh, traffic violence um, and uh, climate change is exasperate, exasperating these things. Yeah. You know, so there's, there are some very severe challenges that for the most part our governments are seeing as uh, business as usual yeah. and, stat and, and the status quo. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for instance, in, in the States, I just read a fantastic um, op-ed mm -hmm. uh, discussing the Surgeon General mm -hmm. and uh, the Surgeon General um, providing a sort of advice about social media and gun violence and, and stating that these are, um, you know, a, a public health emergency. Right. Um, but, okay, what about the traffic violence that is happening every day 
in, yeah. in cities um, in America, over 100 people are dying every day. Yeah. And, um, and underneath this is our uh, reluctance to question um, the comfort of the car. Right. Um, and this is, uh, th this is something that has not gained enough traction mm -hmm. on the highest levels of government. Right. Um, and here in the European, in the European Union, um, there is some momentum around addressing cycling, mm -hmm. but not as much this underlying problem right. of car dependency and car use. So on the European level, the, the European Cycling Declaration, Declaration was signed um, and it lays out several different um, kind of missions that the European Union wants to address mm -hmm. in promoting cycling. Right. Um, and this is, uh, I, I completely acknowledge that this is a um, pretty groundbreaking declaration. Right. However, on the other side of it, um, in our work with cities, mm -hmm. uh, where this declaration touches down is on the street yeah. and in cities. Yeah. And right now, cities in Europe and many places in the world do not have the local capacity to change the policies and institutions that guide uh, transportation systems and infrastructure and behavior. Right. Um, and this is a, a fundamental question that these high-level policy documents have a very difficult time addressing. Right. right. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Um, and um, and I think uh, yeah I think in terms of transportation this is. Uh, this is one of the fundamental questions that how can our transportation systems serve citizens, communities in ways that go beyond serving mobility? Yeah. Because our transportation systems are related to so many other aspects of our lives, our health, our climate, our environment, our children's autonomy. Yeah. And, uh, and these have not yet been addressed. Yeah. And we're, you know, standing here at an intersection which is sort of I would say even at the crossroads if you allow me to say this of you know what we just rode through which yeah. is part of old Amsterdam and the quieter uh, traffic calm streets yeah. to what we see here which is you know traffic. like an auto uh, traffic sewer here yeah yeah, yeah. A, a, an inner city highway yeah um, with thousands and thousands of cars every day going through the city, going cutting through these communities, yeah. passing through. Yes. Right? These, these, these are not uh, drivers who are, who are stopping here to buy something at a bakery or take their kid to, to school here. They're yeah. actually just mostly driving through yeah. the city. And uh, last year, one year ago, mm -hmm. the city of Amsterdam um, decided to uh, install a uh, temporary um, street experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so they transformed this section of the of this corridor, um, a limiting car use mm -hmm. uh, or limiting the the throughput of, of cars. Yeah. Um, and um, and interesting enough, the communications campaign mm -hmm. um, from the city called this a cut, mm -hmm. the knip. Yeah. Yeah. And this incited a huge media storm right. um, that then got local residents involved, uh, that created, um, a, you know, kind of just this, this uh, huge amount of conflict. Yes. There were protests yeah. um, against the, the cut. There were community groups on Facebook, um, uh, there were a lot of um, a lot of hype around uh, around the cut and and uh, the negative, mostly the negative effects of of it. Right. Um, and some some research, actually, a, a master student of mine, uh, 
I just finished uh, her master's thesis on the topic, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and her research showed that some of the residents that she interviewed were they they did not know about the the um, uh, the experiment, but also that the the city um, did provide a lot of communications around it. Mm -hmm. um, so we see that our streets can be these sources of conflict. Right. Um, <laughs> which is a sort of natural consequence. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is a this is a a main um, artery running through the city. Right. Right. Um, with 50, 60, 70 thousand cars a day. Um, and to relatively suddenly um, change the function of the street mm -hmm. um, certainly can activate a lot of conflicting feelings. Yeah. It's, it's almost like part of the problem is that it was framed as a test. And it's a like, cut. And, and, and yeah, and, and, and a cut. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. you know, and even I would even say, even as a cut, as a knip, even if you just did it and say, get over it, <laughs> that would have been better than putting it forth and saying, you know, we're going to test it out and see. Yeah. It just kind of opens the, you know, the door for, for those who are, are going to, you know, really grab onto that and latch into it and yeah. really complain loudly. Because that's the one thing that we do know about human behavior is that when things happen, whether it's the Embarcadero Freeway coming down in an earthquake, yeah. it's like we adjust. Yeah. As humans, we yeah. do shift gears yeah. and, pardon the pun, yeah. and adjust. Yeah, and, adjust. And, adjust. and just the fact that we do have this quote unquote auto sewer, automobile artery running through the heart of the city we, we should be questioning that. <laughs> we should, we should. And we shouldn't be thinking, well, gosh, there's 40, or 40, 000, 40 to 50,000 vehicles going through. How do we keep them doing that? Yeah, how do we keep them doing that? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, and it's, it, it was a complex project to begin with. Right. Um, and um, and I, think, I think the questions that, it, that emerge from it um, are more about um, communications, community engagement, civic right. participation. Um, for instance, you know, what if the city uh, had um, had done a, a more community-led approach? Yeah. I mean, this was a very top-down um, government-led initiative, and um, and you know, we could question, well, how was the community engaged? Yeah. Uh, how were community leaders? Um, empowered to kind of spread the word through their networks. Yeah. Um, we're, we're kind of in a weird part of this, this movement, aren't we? We're, we're in a time when somebody like the mayor of Paris can run on a platform of saying, I'm going to be transforming this city mm -hmm. and you're going to get along and mm -hmm. you're going to like, you know, get used to it mm -hmm. and moving mm -hmm. forward and showing true leadership mm -hmm. um, and, and not pussyfooting around and not mm -hmm. tiptoeing through this concept of just like, we're moving forward, we're going to make this a people or a city for people, not a city for cars, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and powering through. So it's kind of like when we're, as cities, you can help yourselves out. As city leaders, you can help yourselves out, show true leadership, stick to it, and push forward, have a clear agenda, yeah. communicate that agenda to the population. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sometimes, you know, there, there's a time and place for tactical urbanism and pilot projects yeah. and things. Yeah. And, but there's also a time for showing true leadership and engaging the, the communicate the, the the community mm -hmm. but continuous and and yeah. you know community engagement that goes on and on and on forever we don't have that time our yeah. sense of we urgency the of the challenges that we have in front yeah. of us really call for bold leadership yeah it, it very much so um, and in fact a different type of leadership, yeah, right. Um, and this is where you know I think the top-down approach needs to meet with the bottom-up, right? Um, that you know there are uh, vulnerable populations who need better representation yep. in government, um, in urban planning, um, 
in design. Uh, there needs, you know, they, they, the organizations that represent them uh, may not be at the table. Yeah. Um, and um, and I think if uh, if what this questions is is the way that our streets are governed mm -hmm. is changing. Right. And that there's you know there's a lot of different stakeholders that need to be brought in that aren't considered traditional stakeholders. Right. Um, for instance, the media. Right. Right. I mean, what if the city had actually done you know more strategic communications approach with uh, media and, and journalists who were more allies yeah. of the of the changes and right. who presented the. Uh, the case or the, the street experiment in a different light, right? right? What if it wasn't called a cut, yeah. but a stitch? Right. What if it was about uh, children playing in the street? And what if it was more about, we want to improve the access to greenery yeah. um, and, uh, and heal the communities that have been actually um, uh, fragmented in this Place. Right. This is a. I mean, this used to be a, a historic Jewish neighborhood right. that looked uh, and felt like um, the historic Amsterdam that we know. Right. And in um, in the 70s and 80s, it was it was raised in order to build the metro that we're standing on top of right now, mm -hmm. um, and this highway. Yeah. Right. So, what if it was framed? in a different way, yeah. what would have been the outcome? Yeah, that's one of our two biggest challenges too, because we, we find ourselves, you know, again, tiptoeing around, coming up with the right words and the yeah. right phrasing and yeah. framing things yeah. in a certain way. Whereas, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is the haters are gonna hate and the opposition, i.e. motordom and the status quo of mm -hmm. keeping motordom rolling and rolling and rolling, are keen to the fact that we might call it a different word. We yep. might call it a stitch and they're like cued into the fact that yeah. it's like do everything that we can to resist it and do the fear mongering and get people riled up yeah. and through misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we've, we've got our work cut out for us. Yeah, a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work. And yeah. you know, especially for cycling, Yeah. just coming back from the Eurobike uh, fair mm -hmm. um, where um, you know, to be honest, is a very homogenous group right. of um, that the bike industry needs to really think beyond the bike. Yeah. Um, really think about how to attract and work with uh, partners who actually don't are not involved traditionally at all in yeah. in cycling. Yeah, right. Yeah. What about health insurance companies, doctors associations, um, landscaping uh, you know, associations, and uh, much beyond the mobility and cycling space. Right. Um, I mean, the industry, the bicycle industry is talking about, you know, how do we make bikes a little bit more like cars and, uh, yeah. you know, to protect us from the rain. Um, but and there's a lot of pressure to innovate and and innovation is synonymous with technology and speed and efficiency right but what the bicycle can offer is is so much more than that yeah yeah um, and in fact that focus on technology and speed and efficiency could increase inequities yeah right. uh, and exclusion yeah and um, and that's not the direction yeah. that uh, that we want. Yeah, yeah. This is why we're going to yeah. turn left. Okay. Um, this is why bringing in partners from outside of the bike space yeah. is so important because bike projects shouldn't be about cycling. Right. Bike projects need to be about public space and health and greenery and children playing yeah. and um, you know all these other things that everybody cares about. Right, right. Um, it was wonderful too to see with this group of kids, the students, just the diversity 
yeah. of uh, of children, not just from you know who, you know who they were, but also the backgrounds that they had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we need in um, in in planning. We need yeah. people with different backgrounds. Oh, my my area is full. Oh no. <laughs> and again, this is the. The family bike section. Yeah, the, the, the family the, bike section. So this is the bike kitchen. This, this is so, the bike kitchen. Yeah. And yeah, what happens is, in the kitchen? What are we cooking up? <laughs> We're cooking up things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a, a collaboration between Urban Cycling Institute, University of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and a private partner that uh, provided the tools and, and supplies. Yeah. Um, and a bike kitchen is a community space to learn how to repair your bike yourself. I love it. So it's it originates from. Um, yeah, from from lower income communities yeah. where um, you know but where bike repair is a significant burden mm -hmm. on a household income and um, and also a, a space to meet each other um, to to not only learn about bike repair but mm -hmm. but bike repair as a tool to uh, to be empowered right. right and to build community yeah um, and in fact, in France, this uh, bike kitchen and the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, bike kitchens are uh, widely um, uh, established across many different cities, right. um, and serve a huge population of, of cyclists, but also people who are interested in cycling but you know need their bike repaired. Yeah. Um, so this is a, this is our bike kitchen and since opening last October um, we have served I think up to about five percent of the student population. Oh, wow. So about a yeah. thousand about a thousand uh, people. Fantastic. And um, it's also at this point is now 100 percent run by volunteers who have trained themselves as mechanics. Love it. So they have learned to repair their bicycles and in turn are now helping to teach others. Yeah. Um, and the one rule is that you have the mechanics have to stand with their hands behind their back and not touch the bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, because you really have to do it yourself. Yeah, you have yeah. to get your hands dirty. Yeah. Um, it's equipped with all the tools you need. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, and there's also YouTube videos to help mm -hmm. you learn how to do something. Um, and students just book an appointment, and I think it costs two euros yeah, for yeah. 20 minutes. And you come in and, and you learn how to fix your flat tire, repair your chain, uh, you know, these types of things. So um, as Urban Cycling Institute, we are supporting with uh, thinking about the research agenda mm -hmm. for the bike kitchen because we can also learn a lot about what bike kitchens are more symbolic of. Right. Um, that it's not only about bike repair. Yeah. This is about sustainability, circular, uh, circularity. Uh, this is about seeing our, uh, our consumption products, yeah. the products that we consume, not just as a product, but as something that we live with yeah. um, and that we uh, care for. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think for, for you know, society, this is a, this is a big concern um, yeah. for you know, waste and, uh, and, and consumption. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a fantastic project. Yeah, and come on by. I can't think of a better way to end this. This is fantastic. Yeah, thank yeah. you so thank very you. much, Meredith. Thank Again, you. Again, this has been Dr. Meredith Glazer, and uh, you know, a lecturer here at the University of Amsterdam, and the new chair of the University of Ghent. Yeah, chair of cycling. It's chair of cycling. Yeah. Again, congratulations thank and thank you. you so much. Always a pleasure, John. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.